our grave and stay by my side until night turns to day. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in your tender care and fill us forever to live with you there. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here this morning at Holiday United Church of Christ on this first Sunday after Christmas, a rather surprisingly snowy one here in the Salt Lake Valley. For those of you here in the sanctuary, thank you for being here. And for those of you participating online, thank you for joining us as well. We're glad you chose to join us. We are a creation of justice church and an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, meaning that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, we welcome you here. Let's see if anyone has any announcements they needed to share this morning. Martha. So for five weeks, these lovely poinsettias have been growing and growing and growing until Christmas Eve. They were so beautiful. Today is the day they're going home. <laughs> so if you have signed up for a poinsettia, please see me afterwards and we'll put a sleeve on them and send them home with you. Um, unfortunately, because the church will be basically closed next week, if they don't find a home today, they're not going. <laughs> so um, we would like them to all go home. Thank you. Silence as the light of Christ enters the sanctuary. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise God, praise God from the heavens. Praise God from the earth. Please remain seated while we enjoy our opening song. And please join us in singing our opening song. Please do. Yeah. 
Children's chat this morning is a little bit about signs, a little bit about clues, and a lot about the presence of God on earth. And I'm very happy to have my grandchildren here so that they can listen. And I'm going to be reading from a story that I wrote for them called Animals of the World, What's My Name? And let's get started. And thank you, Roger, for running the slides. And let's get the first one up. There you go. I live in the forest. I eat berries and grass. I am especially fond of honey. I also like to eat fish and grubs. Because I eat plants and meat, I am known as an omnivore. In the winter, I often hibernate under the snow inside a warm den. What is my name? A bear, yes. Let's see the next slide. Yes, absolutely right. I am a bear. The world has many kinds of bears, including black bears and grizzly bears, like you see here from Denali in Alaska. Let's see the next slide. Ah. I live in the grasslands and forests of Africa and India because I'm a very large animal. I must eat many pounds of food and drink many gallons of water each day. I can be trained to move heavy logs. People can ride on my back. What is my name? Elephant. Elephant. Oh my goodness, you got that one right. Let's see the next. There it is. Look at that. Well, this next one's going to be a little bit harder. We'll see what happens. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, perfect. These are my footprints on Grandpa Bale's sidewalk. I live under rocks or in his garden and come out early in the morning in the summer when the air is cool. I eat leaves and small plants, so I am mostly a herbivore. I carry my house on my back. What is my name? A snail, you got it right. Let's see the next one. Yes, there he is. Yes, I am a snail. Snails are related to clams and oysters. And like a clam, a snail's body is very soft and protected by a hard shell. Snails only have one foot and that's why they leave these tiny footprints on my sidewalk. Pretty cool, huh? Roger, let's see the next slide. So what are the signs or the clues about the presence of God on Earth? Well, here's one. I don't know if they see Dick and Dee Dee over there, but this is really for them. This is a bald eagle, a young bald eagle, that we saw in Alaska. And it flew within about 30 feet of us while we were sitting and resting. Isn't that amazing? Let's see the next one. This one is a desert bighorn sheep. And almost like the eagle, the sheep came walking down the mountain to within about 30 feet of me. I had my camera, and it laid down and just posed for me. It was terrific. And I'll tell you, that truly felt like the presence of God. Let's see the next one. We see it in the beauty of the earth. This is a picture of Iceland and the snow on the mountain and the beautiful purple lupine in the foreground. Again, this tells me a lot about God's presence. Let's see the next one. And it's close at home, too. This is the spiral of jetty. Many of you have been there, out, I hope, out in the north arm of the Great Salt Lake. And I suspect that God's presence inspired the artist as he built the spiral jetty. Let's see the last one. But most of all, we see God's presence in our children and grandchildren, for they are our future. And as we move into the new year, I encourage all of you, each and every day, to look about you and identify those things that tell you that God is here and watching over us. Thank you so much, Grandpa Bale. Uh, we now have our children's blessing to uh, bless our children as they go out for Sunday school. So 
So let us pray together. Though we gather separately, we are one community in the sanctuary, playground, or at home. As the children depart for Sunday school, our hearts are shining with Christmas love. Love is the reason we are here. God is here with us, and God is out there too. Go with God. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. God of all wisdom, inspire us through the presence of your Holy Spirit so that as we hear your word read and proclaim, we may be filled with understanding and the desire to live as you are calling us to live. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 through 20 and verse 26. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she has made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Listen now to the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know him. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. And they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is good news. If you've ever wondered what Jesus was like as a child, then today's reading from the second chapter of Luke's Gospel is the passage for you. And by that I mean the passage, as in the only passage. I say this because these 12 lines of scripture constitute the only place in the entire Bible where we actually catch a glimpse of Jesus between infancy and adulthood. Now, it seems like only yesterday that we celebrated Jesus' birth because it was, in fact, only yesterday that we celebrated Jesus' birth, an event that takes place in this same chapter of Luke. And as the next chapter begins, we're abruptly transported into the wilderness, where John is in the Jordan River baptizing people, including Jesus. 
who's all grown up at that point. As today's reading gets underway, 12-year-old Jesus and his parents, Mary and Joseph, are making their way to Jerusalem for the annual Passover festival. When the celebration concludes, Jesus and his entourage head back home to Nazareth, but Jesus' parents don't notice for a full day that their young son isn't with them. This had to be an unsettling realization, to say the least. Anyone who's ever lost a kid at the mall for even a few minutes understands how this feels. It's worth noting that this wasn't exactly the kind of family road trip that we tend to take today. Parents and children piling into the SUV to go spend a few days at the Grand Canyon, for example. Now, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were traveling on foot, likely accompanied by a large group of friends and extended family. Because pilgrimage routes were highly susceptible to robbers, there really was safety to be found in numbers. I tell you all this because it might sound strange to us that Jesus' absence didn't register with Mary and Joseph for such a long time. They probably assumed that he was somewhere else in the caravan, you know, with his aunts and uncles and cousins or with the other kids from the neighborhood back in Nazareth. Mary and Joseph weren't bad parents. That's just how these things worked back then. But after a day or so of not seeing Jesus, Mary and Joseph start to get worried. They search for him amongst their traveling companions and up empty. They then work their way backwards towards Jerusalem. After three stressful days of looking around the city, they find Jesus in the temple conversing with the teachers there, presumably about God and religion and stuff like that. An exasperated and relieved Mary cries out, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Jesus replies rather matter-of-factly, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph did not understand what he said to them, and I have to tell you, I kind of get that. Someone who's been a parent to 12-year-olds, I can tell you that's just how it goes sometimes. Now, on the surface, it might sound like young Jesus is being, I don't know, snarky and bratty to his mom and dad here, and maybe he is, but there's more to it than that. Just last Sunday, Pastor Chelsea reflected on the passage from Luke's Gospel known as the Magnificat. The song of praise that Mary sings to God as she begins to understand that this child inside of her is, well, really special. And right before Mary sings that song, she gets a visit from the angel Gabriel who tells her that she's found favor with God, that she will bear a son and name him Jesus, that Jesus will be called Son of the Most High that the Lord God will give to Jesus the throne of the house of his ancestor David, that Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and that of his kingdom there will be no end. This is, of course, really big news. And then, on Christmas Eve, we heard about what happened out there in that manger, when the shepherds were told to go see the Savior who was born to them that day in the city of David, the Messiah, the Lord. When they arrived, these shepherds shared with Mary what had been told them about this child. And Luke tells us that when Mary heard all this, she treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Okay, now if Mary knew all these things about Jesus, that he was heir to David's throne, the Messiah, God's chosen one, wouldn't you think that the temple, the very center of their Jewish faith, would have been the first place that she and Joseph would have gone to find him? And yet, they spend three days running around Jerusalem before even looking for Jesus there. 
So you can't really blame Jesus for reacting to her the way that he does here. Come on, Mom. Where else would I be? He seems to understand and appreciate, at least at some level, who he is and is called to be. But Mary acts as though she's forgotten all of the things she's heard about Jesus when he was an infant. Then again, maybe you can't really blame her for that either. There's a story in Luke's Gospel that comes between the shepherd's visit to the Holy Family on the one hand and today's passage about preteen Jesus on the other. In it, Mary and Joseph take Jesus, who's just eight days old at that point, to the temple in order to present him to the Lord. When they arrive there, they meet an old, devout, and righteous man named Simeon. Now, Simeon seems to have had to have had some sort of connection with the Holy Spirit, who tells Simeon that he would not die until he'd seen the Messiah. When Simeon sees Jesus, he realizes that the Messiah is right there in front of him, and he declares that he can now die in peace. Mary and Joseph are amazed by all the things that Simeon says about Jesus, though it's not anything they haven't heard already. But then Simeon blesses the young Jesus and his family and says this to Mary. This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. After going back and reading this passage, Mary's reaction when she finds the runaway Jesus in the temple makes far more sense. Since before Jesus was born, Mary's been hearing all sorts of great things about how blessed she is among women, about how blessed is the fruit of her womb, about how her son is a savior, a messiah, a lord. But when Simeon speaks, Mary realizes that there's a dark side to all of this, too. Jesus' life won't be easy, and what he endures here on earth will be a sword that will pierce her own soul, too. Having heard Jesus' whole story already, we know that this is true. So I wonder what that trip back to Nazareth was like that day. You know, when Mary began to understand more fully what being blessed by God might actually mean for Jesus and for her. And I wonder what the next 12 years were like as Mary watched Jesus learn and grow as she heard him ask questions, as she saw him play outside with the other kids in the neighborhood. Was there ever a point at which Mary forgot about what Simeon had said back there in the temple? Did she ever think that he might have been wrong? Was there ever a time when she thought that Jesus was going to end up being just like all of the other kids? And did Mary's blood run a little cold that day, all those years later, when she noticed that Jesus was missing not because she didn't know where he was, but because she suddenly realized deep down inside exactly where he was? And did she hope against hope that she would find Jesus somewhere else, anywhere else, but that temple. When Jesus arrived here on earth, good news of great joy, uh, was, was Jesus' arrival here on earth good news of great joy for all the people, including Mary? Most definitely. Was Mary blessed among women, and was her child Jesus blessed too? Absolutely. But in this life, in this world, we all know that joys are often accompanied by some measure of sorrow, and blessings, as wonderful as they may be, are often complicated. Anyone who's ever cared for or about a child knows that. Kids drive us crazy when they're around, and yet we never get all of the time with them that we wished for. We pray that they'll go forth and share their light with the world, and we hope that they'll never actually leave us. We want 
them to grow up and fulfill their God-given potential. And we wince when we realize that this will not always be a safe or easy thing for them to do. And yet, like Mary, maybe all we can do is try to find a way to treasure all of these things in our hearts. These bittersweet joys and complicated blessings, these lives that don't necessarily turn out as we thought they should or hoped they would. And who better to remind us of that than a child? Amen. Our offerings of time and talent and treasure sow our gratitude. God for all that we have and all that we are. And so, in that spirit of gratitude, let us pray. God of generosity and grace, we are thankful for the many blessings you have given us and continue to give us. In this season, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, your greatest gift, we ask that you bless the offerings we continue to make in his name and enable them to be used to serve you in the coming year and beyond. Amen. Now is, of course, the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns in community with one another. Sister and Karen are going to walk around with some microphones. What's on your hearts and minds this morning? A prayer of thankfulness for a successful shoulder surgery for our niece Carmen, who in addition to dealing with that is still adjusting to uh, having MS. Together with God, we hear your prayers. Just a prayer for safe travels for all who are traveling over this holiday period. Together with God, we hear your prayers. A prayer of thanks for the life of Reverend Desmond Tutu, who passed away overnight. He was truly a follower of Christ. And his strong faith shows that one person can certainly make a difference. Together, Together with God, we hear your prayers. we've shared aloud and those known in our hearts only to us and to our creator let us come together once again in the spirit of prayer ever loving God we continue to celebrate the arrival of Jesus among us a baby who was born in a manger a child who was found in the temple sharing your wisdom an adult who talked and healed and shared and blessed and gave your love to all of us, wherever he went, in life, through death, to resurrection. In this season of goodwill, we pray for peace in the world and for all its people, for those caught up in war or violence, for those whose minds are in turmoil, for those who are in physical distress, for all who yearn for peace and stability. We pray for light for the world and all its people, for those who feel that life is bleak, for those for whom brightness is a distant memory, for those living in the deep darkness of anxiety and worry, for everyone everywhere who longs to bask in your light. We 
pray to know your presence in the world and among all its people. For those who are ill, isolated, and lonely. For those suffering pain and grief. For, to those who you might seem far away. For all people who yearn to know your presence and the new life which springs from it. God, hear our prayers and help us to accomplish your will, enabling us to be your hands and your feet and your presence in this world. As we pray through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Light of the World, Emmanuel, God with us. Let us now pray as Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who is in heaven, today, listen to the advice that Paul gave to the Colossians. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive each other. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Amen and amen. And please join us in singing our closing song. Go to the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go to the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Shepherds kept the watching or silent flocks by night. Behold the Jesus Christ is born, the shepherds fear. 